Thank you for joining us for this episode of Exploring Gut Topics with DDNC Advocacy Priority. My name is Cecile Rooker and I am the President and Executive Director for the International Foundation for Gastrointestinal Disorders, or IFFGD. We started our Exploring Gut Topics series as a way to dig deeper into questions that we hear from patients who contact our organization. We hope that you will join us each month to learn more about a new topic. Today, we are taking a deeper dive into the Digestive Disease National Coalition, also known as the DDNC. The Digestive Disease National Coalition is an advocacy organization comprised of major national, voluntary, and professional societies concerned with digestive diseases. The IFFGD has been a member of the DDNC for decades, and we are very excited today to educate our patient community on its history as well as its current advocacy priorities. Today, we welcome to the show three members of the Digestive Disease National Coalition. Dr. Ralph McKibben. Dr. McKibben is a gastroenterologist from Altoona, Pennsylvania. Dr. McKibben is a member of the Executive Committee for the DDNC, as well as a past president. And most recently in 2020, he wrote a white paper with the DDNC that included many key patient access to treatment issues. We'll be discussing that paper in just a few moments. Ms. Jane Holt. Ms. Holt is the co-founder of the National Pancreas Foundation and also serves as the treasurer for the Digestive Disease National Coalition. She's been a member of the Digestive Disease National Coalition for decades and has held the role of treasurer for quite a few years. And finally, Dr. Mr. Dale Dirks. Mr. Dirks is the Washington representative of the Digestive Disease National Coalition and has been with the organization since its inception. So first, we, let's hear a little bit about the history of DDNC. Ms. Holt, can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, so DDNC was started by a wonderful woman, Suzanne Rosenthal and her husband, Erwin, in 1978. Suzanne and her husband were also founders of the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. Suzanne had ileitis and her greatest joy was advocating for patients like herself. So I met Suzanne when I first joined DDNC and she was always a wonderful mentor for me. And uh, Nancy Norton, another wonderful mentor, mentor and founder of the IIF, IFFGD was also a strong influence at DDNC and was chair from 1997 to 2007. I have been a board member for, uh, I'm losing track, but almost 25 years. Um, and DDNC, the main reason why it was founded was to advocate, advocate for issues of common concern for patients with digestive disease. The group represents patients, medical professionals, and industry. Because of this, DDC, DDNC is perceived as not as a narrow interest group, but rather as a broad-based coalition advocating for important public health initiatives. It's recognized by the research community as a valuable resource in creating public awareness of digestive disease, as well as a strong partner in the effort to develop new treatments and improve medical understanding of these conditions. The Public Policy Forum, which we're talking about today, was started 30 years ago. Uh, the Public Policy Forum usually is a two-day event in the first weekend of March. This year, because of COVID, it's going to be virtual, so it's going to be done over three days. The first day is usually focused on policy briefings and information to prepare us, all of us, for our congressional visits. The following two days will be the first virtual congressional visits. The DDNC also hosts a one-day annual international members forum in the fall. Um, it is governed by an all-volunteer board of directors that's made up of individual rep individuals representing patients, organizations, and medical professional societies. The doctors on the board are just as involved as the patients and make up almost half of the board. The board is responsible for selecting the legislative and program priorities and organizing the agenda for the public policy forum. Our professional Washington representation is provided by Health and Medicine Council. And Dale Dirks is one of those people that represent us. 
Fantastic. Thank you so much, Ms. Holt, for uh, that brief history of the DDNC. I know there's been a lot that's been accomplished over the last 30 plus years. So, Mr. Dirks, you've been with the DDNC since its inception. Um, last year, the DDNC published a white paper entitled Patient Access to Care and Treatment in the Shifting Era, Preserving the Patient Provider Decision Making Relationship. That's a mouthful, I know. It was a very, very well written paper by Dr. McKibben and, and others from the DDNC. But can you explain a little bit to us about the history of this paper and, and why the DDNC felt that it was important to write this paper and, and what purpose does it serve? Sure. Uh, thank you very much, Cecile. And, you know, the first thing that I would say is that I think Jane alluded to this is that the organization has been around for quite some time since 1978. And I really think that the hallmark of the organization is its strong uh, volunteer uh, leadership and board. And we uh, are very fortunate to have the resources and thinking of all of the leaders of the various GI societies and patient based organizations in the country. Uh, you, uh, Cecile, Jane Holt, and Ralph McKibben are three great examples of that. Uh, we are a, a tremendous organization that punches way above its weight. And one of the reasons that we're able to do that is because of the leadership of people like you. You know, the, the cost shifting uh, white paper is really an, an educational tool. When a, a patient uh, goes to the pharmacy or um, exp some accesses some other healthcare opportunity, uh, they may walk away from the pharmacy with a different medication or they may go there and the, and the pharmacist says, well, gee, we can't fill this subscription or gosh, um, you know, your copay assistance has run out. Um, and what they're experiencing uh, when they face these tactics is what we call cost shifting. And uh, whether it's copay accumulators, uh, prior authorization, step therapy, specialty tiering, all of those are tactics that third party payers use to shift costs from away from themselves and to the patients. And most of these tactics have, have a name and Dr. McKibben are, is going to you know, describe them a little bit further. But this white paper is an educational tool to pull back the curtain on some of these cost shifting tactics and educate uh, patients around the country uh, and policymakers about these specific tactics and what they can do uh, to um, respond to these tactics. For example, there's a bill pending in the Congress that would um, put guardrails on step therapy and provide some re reform uh, uh, to those policies. They're good common sense uh, 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 changes and a lot of the organizations behind them. And uh, this uh, document was an opportunity for us to pull back the curtain on these uh, cost shifting tactics and um, give uh, legislators a menu of what they can do to try to reverse some of these policies. Fantastic. Well, that was that was a lot. And um, and Dr. McKibben, you are actually the lead author on this paper. Mr. Dirks just mentioned quite a few of these cost shifting <laughs> tactics. Can you explain a little bit better of what some of these are? For example, he talked about going to the pharmacy. Um, quantity limits, medical care. What what does that mean, and how does it affect the patient? So, some of this, if you look back in time, it was quite simple when it came out. If you had quantity limits, you wouldn't go to the pharmacy and look. I'd like a one year supply, and then find out you had your medicine changed and you wasted medicine. So the idea was to limit unnecessary expenses and control the cost for everyone's benefit. But there's creep to this. Certainly now with quantity limits, you may get, you know, enough for one pill a day, but you need two heartburn pills a day. And now you're not able to get the amount that you want. So that's a simple example of what sounded great in the beginning creeps up and causes patient harm. There are unintended negative consequences to these, which are outlined fairly in detail. And this is to empower our members and readers to be able to speak up for their, uh, their patients. So, Quantity limits is simple. It's been around for a long time. Medication tiers started out as simple too. I think everybody remembers generic versus name brand, but that has expanded. Now we have um, 
preferred name brand, non-preferred name brand specialty tiers. And what's going on with that is that they've added higher and higher levels of copay and coinsurance so that when you go to the pharmacy, you may not be able to afford your medication. You've not reached your out-of-pocket maximum, your deductible, et cetera. Um, so that these are actually causing negative consequences, poorer outcomes, and in fact, increased system costs. So while the pharmacy costs may be lower, the cost to the system and to all of us have gone up. Wow. Yes. Um, I know that I personally have had a few of those conversations in the pharmacy. Um, but here's one that you hear a lot about and the one that Bill taught and that Dale Dirks mentioned, there's a bill in the Senate about step therapy. Um, step therapy has affected many people. Um, I know personally, I have been affected by that uh, with my GI illness. Can you sort of explain what that is so that people can understand? Right. So step therapy, again, these things are designed in principle to be of benefit and cost saving, but that's for a group of people. Individuals have individual needs. You may have allergies. You may have other illnesses that would prevent you from taking a medication, uh, cross reactions, etc. So the doctor patient relationship the informed consent and discussion before you choose a plan of, of treatment is the cornerstone what happens in step therapy is you look at generic guidelines and say you should try drug x is cheap you know try an over-the-counter tums before you go to a prescription medicine kind of a concept but what happens is when you're on step therapy the one, the steps change underneath you. You may be on a medication and then find out the formulary has changed. You now have to go back to a medicine that you failed in the past and you have to document like three months of that treatment before you can get back to where you were. Um, you may not be able to get uh, the form of medicine that you want. In other words, a pill, you may have to go to an infusion or injection, et cetera. And so there are negative outcomes. And the other thing that happens is if you go around this, you're probably liable for the entire expense of the medication or much larger co-pays and deductibles. So the evidence shows that impeding the doctor-patient relationship delays access, leads to higher hospitalizations, increased costs to the, all stakeholders, the formulary payers, the, the companies that are paying for this, uh, the government agencies, but most especially to the patient. Absolutely. I, I remember changing insurance companies. And uh, when I changed my insurance company, they wanted me to start back on over the counter medication before I could get my prescription filled. And it was a very expensive and frustrating time for me. Um, and that's when I really learned what step therapy meant. And um, so definitely something that is very um, touches a lot of a lot of people these days in many different disease states. Um, so there were a lot of things covered in the paper. Can you tell us a little bit about non-medical switching? Because that I know also affects people. Sure. So non-medical switching is a hot topic. Uh, what happens is, let's say you're on drug A for your uh, chronic condition, intestinal disease, Crohn's, colitis, whatever it is. Um, your pharmacy benefit manager says this is good. At the end of the prescription year, if you're like on a July rollover, on your insurance plan, they may change their formulary in January or at any time and say the medication that you were on is no longer on your formulary. You have to go to a completely different medication. The biosimilars are going through this right now. There are companies that are looking, say, you've been stable on Remicade. You must switch to a different medication uh, starting in February. So that's upcoming. Um, that also, though, applies to medical supplies. If you have an ostomy, you have a brand that fits you, you've used it, and now all of a sudden that's not the cheap generic anymore, so you're going to have to switch to a different product that doesn't seal as well for you, doesn't fit as well, and has other problems. The other problem with this is it's non-consented switching. In other words, you had the doctor-patient relationship, you pick and chose the side effects, risks, and benefits, and now you're being told you will switch because of cost, but there's no doctor's visit that goes with that explaining to you what it is so that you can do that. So it's an additional injury to this, an additional risk to patients, and uh, the costs are driven up as well. 
Yes, I, I could see how that would happen. Um, so is this any way related to prior authorization? I know that's something we hear in the doctor's office is a lot. Um, I need prior mm -hmm. authorization. What, what does that mean when the doctor says that? Prior authorization started out with testing. I think x-rays, CAT scans is a way to control costs. They wanted to be sure that the tests are necessary. That concept rolled over into medications. Um, it is a growing thing. The companies each put their um, restrictions on the formulary. Before you can get approval, you have to prove to the company that this is a necessary thing. It's a bit of a black box. They usually do not publish the criteria, but a simple example is you have to fail two or three old heartburn pills before you can get the new one, something like that. Um, it's actually a huge problem. The average physician spends 14 to 15 hours a week doing authorizations per physician, not the practice, but each individual provider. Uh, it, there's a cost to it. It's a delay. And it's a technique where many people, uh, practices may say, we don't do prior authorizations. I'll send you to an out-of-town yeah. specialist or something like that. So there's a struggle to get the medication. Um, you have steps. There is no consistency in the time frame. There's no 48 hour turnaround or something like that. And there are bills looking to do that, but um, it's very restrictive. And a lot of people are denied the medication that works best for them because the authorizations are difficult to get. Thank you. Um, I know that uh, that is an issue and that there's ways to get around the, the prior authorization and to be able to um, to work with your drug company to get past it, but it is a huge obstacle that's in place for patients. Um, the last thing I wanted to ask you about that I saw in your white paper uh, was about copay accumulator adjustment mm -hmm. programs. That just seems like a fancy word for something. So it is. I don't know if it's a fancy word. It's a it's smoke and mirrors, I think. But the long and short of it is it's the latest thing. Uh, some of the uh, manufacturers have put forth coupons or, or ways to get extra money. There are charity organizations that will assist with your co-pays if you're in that deductible phase. The pharmacy benefit uh, distributors and, and uh, managers feel that this is, in fact, money that they're entitled to and should not count towards your out-of-pocket maximums, should not count towards your deductibles. So if you get a discount coupon to reduce the cost of medicine and make it affordable, you will then be charged that amount on your out-of-pocket maximum, et cetera. So again, it's shifting the cost onto the patient. There was no change for the manufacturer. It was just a change for the patient, but that is being claimed by the insurance company or pharmacy benefit manufacturer so or manager. So the idea is, of course, that use may go up because people can afford it, uh, and these programs are then shift, shifting this on to patients. The median family income in the U.S. is around $58,000, and, and that's for cities and rural areas. Uh, price is not adjusted by city and rural, so many patients, particularly in rural areas, on a $40,000 family income, may have to pay one or two thousand dollars a month for their expensive medications which is absolutely unaffordable and these are huge negative consequences so it's another thing to be recognized when you advocate for your patients and yourself thank you dr mckibben and and thank you for these great explanations and examples for all of these different cost shift, cost shifting tactics and for those of you watching today at the end of this program we will have a link to the DDNC white paper, it's on their website, and the website is www.ddnc.org, but we will have that link for you available at the end of our program, where you can read more about all of these cost shifting tactics that um, are out there that we can advocate if we join together and try to bring some resolution to these patient access issues. So, Mr. Dirks, uh, these are all really great important issues for patients and um, and I know that you've spent many years, your entire career, in fact, advocating for patients, their access to treatments, and all other types of healthcare issues for patients with many different disease states. Can you tell us, uh, from your experience, how can people get involved to raise awareness about these cost shifting tactics and other issues? All right. Uh, thanks, Cecile. And, you know, I, I would, I guess, first acknowledge that 
you know, we're working in a different environment um, uh, during this COVID pandemic. Uh, uh, most of the congressional representatives and their staff are working remotely. So we've had to get a little creative uh, about how we approach these issues, but notwithstanding the fact that they're working remotely, they're making decisions every day that impact Americans, whether it's the federal budget or health uh, related policy. So it's important to keep in touch uh, with your legislators. Uh, for example, you, you mentioned that the DDNC has held uh, our annual public policy forum for 30 years. In fact, it wasn't exactly 30 years uh, last year. We had the 30th anniversary this year. Um, and, and typically that's been an in-person event where people are people from all over the country fly in uh, hear about the uh, key issues uh, from people like myself and then uh, fan out on Capitol Hill in teams uh, the, uh, the next day and talk with their legislators about these key issues. Uh, this year, we're going to be doing a virtual event. It's a, uh, it's a, the first uh, weekend in March, as Jane mentioned, uh, every year. And uh, we'll be doing some briefings to get people up to speed on the key issues. And one of these key issues is the discussion about this cost shifting white paper as an educational tool to um, uh, make uh, legislators more knowledgeable about these tactics that are used by third party payers. And the fact that there is a solution, at least one uh, pending, uh, there is a House and uh, House and Senate legislation that uh, uh, addresses uh, step therapy reform places guardrails on the practice of step therapy reform and essentially puts in the opportunity for a timely uh, appeals process on a, a step therapy um, a decision that uh, more benefits the patient than it does the third party payer. So um, we are going to be holding the public policy forum uh, and I know the DDNC will be doing that. I know the IFFGD is going to follow up uh, with uh, their own and so is the National Pancreas Foundation going to be following up uh, with their uh, uh, legislative uh, activity on Capitol Hill. It's really important to contact your legislators to talk with them about these issues. They don't know uh, the names of these uh, tactics that are used, and we can use the white paper to educate them. And then we also have some solutions built in uh, as well. It's it's uh, we will be providing training uh, for. Uh, participants uh, for the public policy forum on these key issues and we'll also be scheduling meetings, putting them uh, together with the other uh, folks from their geographic area to work in teams. And typically they do a really great job of educating the legislators about some of these key issues and talking with them about what they can do to help resolve them. Um, I uh, really wanna encourage uh, people to participate in the public policy forum already uh, just since we started registering, registering people at the first of the year, we've got over hundred participants uh, registered for the public policy forum. Typically when we have an in-person event, we usually have about 150, uh, but we expect maybe over 200 because when you think about it, uh, if you have to come to an in-person event to be an advocate, it uh, usually entails taking a couple of days off work, the cost of travel uh, in a virtual event, you have the opportunity to be an advocate uh, remotely uh, or virtually and participate with your teammates uh, in, in that uh, uh, manner. Uh, so typically we've been getting more people participating in our advocacy events when they can do it uh, remotely or virtually. So we're look very much looking forward to it and we're very encouraged by the number of people that we have registered so far for the public policy forum. That's fantastic. Um, those numbers are very promising. So. What you're, what you're telling us today is that we're going to spend a couple of days where you're going to educate the audience on how to advocate and, and the issues and what those issues are. But then you said we're actually going to get in teams and do meetings. So you're asking the members that are going to participate in your public policy forum to contact their congressional offices in team. I have a lot of people that wonder and ask, does that really work? Do they really care? Uh, why are we going to do that? Can you explain a little bit what the importance is of sure. people actually making those phone calls? Sure. Uh, first off, you know we'll be working with each team to, to help them schedule their meetings, so they don't they won't have to go through the, the process of scheduling their their meetings. All they really have to do is show up for them uh, as a team. 
So that takes a lot of burden off people who, have, who are uh, registering. We'll, we'll be scheduling those meetings and keeping in, in touch with the teams. And, um, you know, I'll say that advocacy pays off. You know, legislators listen to their constituents because they're the ones that send them to Washington every two or six years. Mm -hmm. So uh, they're, they're bound to listen to uh, their constituents because they want to keep their finger on the pulse of what they're, the people that send them to Washington uh, care about. And I'll just give you an example. Uh, you know, one thing that I'll tell you, and anybody who's done this for a while uh, understands and appreciates that things don't happen overnight. But just at the end of the year, uh, the DDNC and other uh, GI societies and patient-based organizations had a big victory. And we had been working on it for almost a decade, uh, but we finally convinced Congress to reverse a policy uh, related to uh, um, colonoscopy that actually penalized a person for um, having a, a polyp diagnosed during routine colonoscopy and forced them to, uh, to pay a copay. Uh, we've reversed that policy and legislators made that decision because they heard from an overwhelming number of people around the country how important it was and that the benefit of um, waiving that copay on a screening colonoscopy in the event that a polyp was found far out the benefit far outweighed the cost so um it doesn't happen overnight but i can tell you with all the pressures that congress uh, has on them to um, make uh, decisions and all of the people that are asking for something if uh, if you don't weigh in you don't have an opportunity to make very much progress so, you know there's an old saying about you're either uh, at the table or on the menu and at, in, in this case uh, we were at the table and got Congress to make a favorable decision in support of uh, uh, patients all around the country that are getting screened for colon cancer and the, the healthcare professionals that care for them. That's fantastic. And what a wonderful win that was for all of us in yeah. December. And we're looking forward to seeing that step therapy uh, legislation and other bills follow that same course um, as we continue to advocate. For those of you at home, remember what Dale said, you will have many opportunities throughout the course of 2021 and beyond to participate in advocacy events, such as the Digestive Disease National Coalition, their 31st annual public policy forum. Please also remember that you can contact advocacy at IFFGD.org at any time to get more information about contacting your legislators. Doesn't have to be a part of a big event with a with a national organization, you can just do it locally on your own. Contact us and we'll let you know how. So, Mr. Dirks, uh, Dr. McKibben informed us about several of these great um, issues to bring before our congressional offices, patient access to, to treatment. And those are, I know, part of what the DDNC advocates for in Washington. What other issues does DDNC like to raise with the congressional offices? Right. Uh, I, you know, I think it's really important to point out that the DDNC categorizes its advocacy priorities in three areas. Uh, the first is research, and we advocate for additional funding for the National Institutes of Health, specifically the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Diseases, the National Cancer Institute, and others. Um, and then the Department of Defense has a uh, medical research program in which several digestive diseases are focused on through the DOD. We advocate for that as well, along with the Veterans Administration. They have a significant and substantial medical research program that focuses on issues such as Gulf War illness. And many people with functional GI disorders um, are in that category. Um, the other, uh, the second thing is the uh, is patient access to care. And uh, we've discussed a lot already the cost shifting uh, document and the tactics, but that falls under the category of uh, patient access to care. If we uh, can uh, educate the legislators about these cost shifting tactics and provide them a solution like the step therapy legislation, we'll be successful in educating members of Congress and, and hopefully uh, have better outcomes for patients. The third is public health and professional awareness. We advocate for any number of programs at agencies like the Centers for Disease Control. They have a specific program on inflammatory bowel disease. They have a specific program on viral hepatitis. 
and they have a specific program focused on colon cancer screening. So those are the, the key issues that we'll be focusing on at this year's public policy forum. And I can say that for every group in the DDNC, there's something on that list that's critically important to them. Absolutely. That's a very extensive list. That's a lot to think about. And as you said, not every single item needs to be addressed by every single advocate. And for those of you who were furiously trying to take notes, trying to figure out whether or not you could remember everything that uh, Mr. Dirks just informed us about, please remember that all of this information will be gone over again in the public policy forum. That information, all of the resources will be given to you um, as an advocate by any of the um, advocacy events that you may want to attend, whether it's with the DDNC, with uh, IFFGD, the Dystonia Foundation, the Pan National Pancreas Foundation, all of us will provide materials for you and give you additional education and answer any questions that you have. Um, so please make sure that you register for these events so that you can learn more. Cecile, if you don't mind me interrupting, um, I, I think it's really important uh, and, and you pointed this up, uh, everybody's going to have briefing material uh, uh, for them. And um, I've been referring to some notes during our discussion, and you may or may not have noticed that, but you'll be able to do that during your discussion with legislators. You'll have that information right in front of you on your, you know, in front of your computer screen. So uh, the other thing is that you don't have to be an expert on all of these legislative issues. You don't have to know all these budget numbers. You don't have to know even uh, you know, uh, you don't have to put a name to all these cost shifting tactics. Uh, what's important is that you're able to tell your story and how you're impacted by some of these things. Uh, we have the information that you need in order to help convince legislators to take an action uh, that benefits patients and healthcare providers uh, with digestive diseases. So don't worry about that. Uh, what's most important is that you're able to bring your story to the table and help be a part of the solution. Absolutely. And, you know, some people wonder what that's going to be like. And, uh, Ms. Holt, you've participated in quite a few public policy forums for years. I know I've done some with you. So, um, I was wondering if maybe you could tell people a little bit about your personal experience as being an advocate here on the Hill. Sure. I'd be happy to. Um, so. One of the things, my first thing I'll say is that uh, visiting the congressional staffers is really interesting. I mean, I've always enjoyed every time I've gone into each and every office. It's just, it's such a learning experience for all of us. But um, it will be a little bit different this time. We don't get to watch, walk in front of the Capitol and get that real feeling of being there. We'll have to do it by Zoom, but I think the basically the procedure will be pretty much the same. So I think has been mentioned, we'll, we'll all be divided up into teams and the teams are usually between six and 10 people. Um, and the teams work together for all of the meetings. Once you have your team, you work together for every call. And usually uh, the teams will select a, one person to be the leader that will kind of guide them through the meetings and maybe introduce the, well, us, the DDNC when we first go in and we'll help, help move the meeting along. But, Really, what ends up usually happening is that, you know, as as Mr. Dirk said, um, we we have whole our list of our key priorities. Um, and so what we usually do is when we go into the room or when we do our virtual meeting, each person gets a chance to introduce themselves. And when they introduce themselves, they also have a minute or two to hit on one of the key issues that's important to them. Um, you know, we have to be brief, but it's amazing how quickly and how much we're listened to. Uh, a lot of times the staffers will ask us questions um, and, you know, we all get a chance to answer. Um, and one of the things you really need to know is that all the staffers are different. Some are very much engaged and ask us lots of questions. Some kind of act like they're not paying any attention, but the reality is they are. They are listening. They might have something that's really important that's in the back of their mind, but they are paying attention. And what we say and do really makes a difference. Um, one of the things I always like to tell um, those who are going to uh, lobby for the first time is a very good friend that was one of these staffers. And 
we used to go and visit her because she happened to be uh, from from one of our states. And you know, long after she left, she came over to me at a, at a party that we were at. And she said, I just really want you to know, Jane, when the Digestive Disease National Coalition comes to lobby, we actually listen because it is such a different, so different from all of the groups. We come with physicians, we come with nurses, we come with patients and patients of, with all different types of digestive problems. And she said, it's just amazing how much of an impact that has on us. So you can feel that very confident that when you're going, whatever you say and whatever you do is gonna make a huge difference. And you'll feel very proud by the time you leave. Fantastic. Yeah, that's, you know, I have to tell you, every time I leave, I feel very invigorated yeah. um, and motivated and, and to what, what can happen. So it, it is definitely a fantastic, um, rewarding feeling that you get from advocating for yourself and others. But um, just really quick, um, do you have any advice for people uh, participating the first time in an advocacy event? Sure, especially for this uh, virtual meeting, I think the most important thing is to be sure you join the meeting that's gonna be set up by the Digestive Disease National Coalition to meet with your group. Because you need to be organized before, especially with Zoom meetings, you need to be organized before you go in so that you're prepared to you know, speak in an orderly manner and get your points across. But the other thing I really wanna emphasize is just go there and have fun. Feel really happy that you're a part of this. Even if you're not comfortable saying anything, just your being there and telling the staffers what your disease is and why you're there, that's all you really have to do, it makes a huge difference. And, and just, just really enjoy it. That's the most important thing. And you'll wanna come back, I promise you. Thank you so much, Ms. Holt. Dr. McKibben, yeah. I know that you've spent your fair share of uh, miles on the Hill. What kind of advice might you might give our audience today? So I think uh, I'll give just a, a one second history. You know, I was one of the founders of the first, one of the first colon cancer prevention charities in the country. It was a local thing. I went around and did the dog and pony show and, and tried to get people to get screened, et cetera. This is probably almost 30 years ago. And I realized with time that I could do this forever and only talk to a small number of people. And uh, by studying the, po the process and policies for change, I realized I needed to influence the influencers. And I became uh, of organized medicine, the Pennsylvania Society of Gastro, and eventually DDNC, et cetera. While you may be one voice, I want you to feel empowered to go speak to your representatives. As you said, even just sitting in the chair and saying, I have disease X, they know that people are so affected that they would be bothered to go to Washington. And that means something. Uh, the purpose of the white paper as an aside is an empowerment thing. I want you to, people to have vocabulary, to understand what the issue is about. You don't need to regurgitate the statistics, but it's also an evidence-based approach to advocacy. You know that there is actually proof that you are being harmed by these activities, and that should empower you and make you more passionate about what's going on. Because I think sometimes we feel like complainers and, oh, that was just me, but I don't really know what goes on with other people. This should empower you to sit there, say your story, illustrate, be the illustration for this and let people know what's going on. And so I would just say, do it, show your passion, go there and you'll have a lot of fun doing it. It's the way it works and I'm hooked. I'm, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> That's really wonderful to know. Dr. Dirk, I mean, Mr. Dirks, any last comments for us before we close today? Uh, yes, and thank you. Uh, uh, I want to thank the three of you for putting this together. I think it's really great and hopefully, you know, we'll be able to share this information uh, with folks in advance of the public policy forum and uh, get more people involved. A couple of observations that I'll make. Number one is uh, even though, you know, members of Congress are working remotely, their staff are working remotely during the last nine or 10 months, while everybody has been working remotely, we have found members of Congress and their staff remarkably accessible and they want to hear from their constituents because the typical and usual way that they hear from constituents is not available to them people are uh, virtual a lot of people are staying home they're social distancing so they have a, a thirst uh, and um, for hearing what their constituents want uh, the the ddnc public policy forum the ifg and the npf uh, policy forms 
are an opportunity for people with like minded uh, concerns to come together and educate their legislators about um, these things that are important to them. And particularly now, when legislators don't have the opportunity to interact with people personally, they're really hungry for information. Um, and uh, taking the time and effort to join these adv advocacy efforts can really pay off. And we have found people that work with these uh, congressional offices and the members highly accessible and very interested in what we have to say. So true. Thank you so much, Dale. And we hope that this show has empowered you as Dr. McKibben said, and, and really motivated you to be a part of an acting change for the future, to advocate on behalf of yourselves and others and in this healthcare landscape and knowing confidently that you've got help along the way and that there'll be those to guide you, those who've done it before, there'll be plenty of resources and materials for you. For more information about any of these events or any of these materials we've talked about, Please reach out to us at IFFGD at IFFGD.org and we'd be happy to point you in the right direction. You can also find a wealth of information on our website, which is IFFGD.org and also on the website of the, Net, the Digestive Disease National Coalition or DDNC.org. Remember to register today to be a part of that public policy forum uh, the first weekend in March and uh, be able to talk more confidently about these different topics, we will have a link to that white paper for you so you can read up. I know we've covered a lot of material and that we have had these wonderful speakers. Thank you, Ms. Holt, Dr. McKibben, and Mr. Jerks for your time today, uh, helping us to understand these issues and what it means to be an advocate in today's world, especially with all that's going on with the pandemic. We hope that you at home have enjoyed this episode and that you will contact us more about how to advocate for your digestive health. Thank you.